So hi, everybody. This is round two due to technical difficulties of uh, Aquatic Invasive Species Landing Blitz webinar that we're doing for the state of Ohio virtually this year um, instead of a um, in-person event due to COVID-19 that's happening. So the um, I'm going to be talking about what aquatic invasive species is very briefly, why anyone as a recreational water user should um, care about aquatic invasive species, and then I'm going to go into a campaign that's specifically for recreational water, water users about helping to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species, as well as this landing blitz, which is what Ohio is participating as a part of um, this week here, uh, the end of June and beginning of July in 2020. Um, I'm then going to rotate around to some of our partner organizations to let them share some of the resources and information that they have on either educating on aquatic invasive species or helping to prevent spread of aquatic invasive species either in their organization or with other uh, members of, of the general public. And then I'll conclude with a final kind of action remember and reminder um, in hopes that uh, those of you who are viewing this webinar uh, can be encouraged to take steps in your own lives um, and in your own recreational water activities to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species. So why should we care? Um, aquatic invasive species simply are that. They're an invasive species. They're a non-native species uh, that causes harm uh, to native species that belong in a specific area. And the aquatic term refers to the fact that they are found in water bodies or in aquatic environments. And when it comes to the recreational boating industry or other recreational water users, anything from duck hunters to scuba divers to um, hand-powered uh, paddle craft. Um, aquatic invasive species are found in water bodies all across the state of Ohio and can be spread by any of those uh, recreational water users um, who are enjoying the wonderful waterways in the state of Ohio. Um, however, uh, these invasive species can significantly impact um, your recreational activities, uh, either directly or indirectly. Um, as far as directly, they can impact, um, in some states, there are significant uh, decontamination and inspection programs um, that are required for vessels going to and from a body of water if they are traveling to a new body of water. Um, it can be a direct impact on your vessel, uh, whether you have power or hand-powered um, hand paddle craft, um, impacts on engines, motors, on the bottom of vessels, impacts on marina infrastructure, impacts on other underwater infrastructure, and then um, even going to the impact of whether or not you can even uh, use a water body recreationally. Um, there have been documented examples of aquatic invasive species shutting down entire water bodies because the growth of those invasive species were so thick or so dense that you actually couldn't enjoy that uh, recreationally by vessel um, due to that invasive species being there. So out of this and out of the fact that we've been um, trying to deal with and respond to aquatic invasive species in the Great Lakes and across the country for quite some time, um, there's a national campaign called Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers um, that it was put together with the core goal of developing a consistent message for preventing the spread of aquatic invasive species in the recreational water, um, water use industry. So again, anyone from, you know, power boaters, sailors, paddle craft, um, scuba divers, even people that go to the beach, there's things that you can do um, to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species. The core motto of the Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers campaign is clean, drain, dry. Um, I believe Heather will go into that a little bit more um, during her piece. Um, but the purpose of this is just to hopefully create a consistent um, and effective and easy to remember uh, guideline for how to prevent the spread of invasive species to develop a campaign and a brand awareness so that no matter where you go across the country, you can hopefully see this campaign, see um, billboards, see stickers, see decals, um, and things like that so that you can be reminded to take your part um, to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species and then to encourage partnerships. Um, so I encourage you, if you're interested in learning more about this campaign, 
um, you can go to stopaquatichitchikers.org for more information. I wanted to provide just a brief overview of equipment, just because when I talk to a lot of gen general public um, members, I the first thing you think of is, okay, you know, boats and trailers and things like that. Yes, there's invasive species that can be transported on boat trailers and um, in kayaks, maybe if you're going from body of water to body of water. But the reality is there's a large number of things that can easily spread invasive species. And so this list here is just an example, um, just a short example of some of the things you may be using in your recreational water activities that could um, be spreading aquatic hitchhikers. So our recent effort, so we, it was first, you know, we had issues with invasive species, then there's a national campaign. And then in the past two years, um, there's been a group of organizations partnering across the Great Lakes states, including United States and Canada, uh, working together on an event called, an annual event, called the uh, Great Lakes Aquatic Invasive Species Landing Blitz. And the idea behind this event was a collaborative outreach campaign where um, groups volunteer along with partners and state agencies and organizations to deliver consistent messaging about preventing the spread of invasive species at areas where there are a, a high amount of uh, recreational water use, and especially where there's areas where um, people are traveling from one body of water to another. Um, this event occurs during a set time frame and it's promoted locally and statewide. Um, if you follow any news media on invasive species, you might have seen that um, if, if you see this recently, and this is July of 2020, there's a whole slew of press releases and social media um, content about the AIS landing blitz, as we're calling it, um, during the past couple of weeks. And that's because of all these states working together to promote awareness about this issue. So to learn more about this event and to become involved, uh, if you happen to view this webinar after these dates of June 28th to July 10th, that's totally fine. Uh, this is going to be an annual event. And so we encourage you to learn more about the event, um, to sign up as a partner on the website, and to consider participating in the future when hopefully you may be able to get back to having in-person outreach events at some point. Um, and on the website, there's not only a list of locations um, and local partners in each state um, and province across um, the Great Lakes region, but also there's some information on how to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species and then some good uh, media information, including a really nice fact sheet that talks about, again, the, the impact of uh, aquatic invasive species on recreational water uses and, and what's being done in the Great Lakes. So at this point, I'm going to switch over to some of our partners that are collaborating with us um, as part of this event in Ohio. And I'm going to offer them the opportunity just to share with a little bit with you on what they do and um, how they work to either help educate or prevent the spread of invasive species. So I think we're, right now I'm gonna start with Heather Sheets. That's all right. Okay, can you see my screen okay? Yep, looks good. And I'm gonna mute okay. myself. Thanks, Heather. Okay, thanks. Hi, um, my name is Heather Sheets. I am with the Ohio Clean Marinas program. Um, and just a background first of our program, um, we are um, a statewide program that encourages voluntary incentive-based participation from both our boaters and our marinas. Um, our team of three educates marinas and boaters on best management practices. Um, we also provide compliance assistance, mostly with our um, marinas, and also training workshops uh, for both boaters and marinas. Um, we administer kind of an offshoot of our program called the Ohio Clean Boater Program, and we'll go more into that because it deals more with invasive species there. Um, we help to protect 3,965 square miles of water and 312 miles of uh, Lake Erie shoreline. And um, ultimately, we, we hope to improve water quality and wildlife habitat. I just wanted to mention this really, really quickly. Um, because this is the Great Lakes uh, Aquatic Invasive 
species blitz, um, I just wanted to share that there are clean marina programs not only in Ohio but in all of the Great Lakes states and there is actually a great um, website uh, for the Great Lakes Clean Marina program and they have lots of educational resources there. So just as a little plug for them. Um, so for the Ohio Clean Marina's Boater Program, um, like our marina program, it is a voluntary stewardship program and basically our boaters pledge to help keep the uh, coastal and inland waterway resources clean. Um, they follow environmental best man management practices, which as you'll see in a couple seconds involves um, stopping the spread of aquatic invasive species. And um, as a team, the Clean Marinas team, um, we conduct outreach at recreational boating events and also provide training to um, not only our boaters, whether it's at a marina or an event, but also we've expanded our program a little to um, educate other educators in the field so that we can kind of expand the message. So uh, for, I kind of did a good best and better that we sort of promote, so for our, our marina managers, good is providing signage, um, showing boaters and reminding them at ramps how to rinse, drain, and dry. Um, better would be providing training workshops either with us or they show our videos um, to their boaters about aquatic invasive species. And then um, the ultimate best would be providing training and then also um, even better if they can provide a wash pad or power washing services to their boaters. So for boaters, uh, the good is inspecting their boat trailers and all equipment, removing any vegetation, debris, or animals, um, draining the water from everywhere on their boat, their motor, bilge, wells, wells and then planning and recording their efforts. Better would be to inspect, remove, and drain everything that they've taken with them on their trip. Um, cold rinse boats, trailers, and equipment with just a simple garden hose or anything you have. Um, and disinfect with a mild bleach or salt solution on all equipment. Um, again, further for boaters, best would be to inspect, remove, drain, and decontaminate. Um, and that decontamination would be with high pressure rinse with a pressure washer or um, basically that's made to uh, use on boats and trailers. And then we went a step further and said exceptional would be to inspect, remove, drain, and decontaminate, but this time with a hot pressure rinse, um, 140 degrees Fahrenheit for uh, boats and trailers. And then I just wanted to end with, uh, we have several resources there. So further information on our clean uh, marina and boater program, the Ohio AIS field guide, um, aquatic invasive species in the Great Lakes fact sheet, AIS best practices for boaters. Um, we have a series of YouTube videos, not only on AIS, but other best management practices um, that we like our boaters to use. And then clean boats, clean tournaments, YouTube video um, for uh, basically information on how to use a power wash um, for those boats. And that's all. There's some information about the Clean Marinas program there at the begin or at the end if you want to get more information. Thanks, Heather. So um, just a real quick briefing on Ohio Sea Grant. So who are we? We're actually a partnership between uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and, and OSU, so Ohio State University Extension. Um, we're one of 34 programs. So every state in the country that has a coastline has a Sea Grant program. Uh, and we really focus on outreach or extension work and education and research. So. What we're going to go over mostly here today is the extension and outreach portion of that and specific to aquatic invasive species. So uh, you can see myself and Sarah as some of our extension agents here, but there are more of us. So we're all across the coast and we're all happy to answer your questions. Uh, anything regarding 
uh, not only invasive species, but any Lake Erie questions you have. So just a plug for Ohio Sea Grant extension. And then just real quick, I wanted to go over a few uh, annual events that we have um, that we like to educate people about. You've already heard about the Clean Marinas program and the education to marinas and boaters themselves. Um, we have a pretty good relationship with the charter captains. And so we do an annual charter captains conference uh, that really has a lot of different topics, but aquatic invasive species are always on display, literally, uh, and, and talked about. And, so that our captains can be advocates against the spread of invasives. Um, we also do an annual uh, sport fishing course and workshop at Stone Lab. And as you've heard from, from Sarah, that uh, anglers can be a, a vector in the spread of invasive species. So every time we're getting people involved in fishing, uh, we want to make sure that they know the, the risks and how to, how to stop the spread. Um, so those are good avenues for that. Um, you also see a picture there in the middle of the Aquatic Visitor Center. That's a Division of Wildlife building that Ohio Sea Grant runs as an outreach center. And they see thousands of people on a normal summer. Um, so a lot of invasive species stuff there as well. We also will see folks at boat shows and fairs. Um, one specific camp that we go to is 4-HC camp. And so that's on Kelly's Island. And kids get a crash course in, in everything Lake Erie. Um, and we all do youth programs uh, reaching over, mine says 1,000 kids annually, but that's just for me. So the rest of us probably hit around that number. So we're seeing five to 7,000 kids uh, every year and a big focus is invasive species, what they are, how to identify them and how to prevent the spread. Um, other than, than youth, we also work with professionals as well. Uh, so you'll hear from some Division of Wildlife folks and, and some of them that you will hear from uh, have taken part in our, our HACCP training. I probably should have spelled that acronym out for you. Uh, that stands for Hazard Analysis and Critical Control Points. And so what that is, is um, kind of a lesson plan uh, for our teacher friends out there listening, uh, that you break down your activity, uh, in this case, a natural resource management activity, into steps and you find out where you may be most likely to spread invasive species and then really make sure that you're taking every precaution so that that does not happen. And a lot of that is clean, drain, dry, uh, similar to recreational um, advice, uh, but we also have some other more um, more harsh chemicals we can use or salts and bleach and things like that to, to clean gear if it's needed, depending on how that has a plan turns out. And speaking with teachers, we also do teacher workshops as well and have some products like uh, we call it an attack pack. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of that here, uh, but it has some specimens um, preserved of invasive species and lesson plans. And so they can go back to their classrooms and reach all of their kids in their classrooms as well with invasive species education. Uh, and then for some publications, so you've actually seen uh, the last slide, but Heather's had a couple of these on it, so thank you, Heather. Um, these are all hyperlinked. I'm not sure if we'll be able to share the presentations with you, uh, but if not, you can just Google these with Ohio Sea Grant uh, if you have internet access, and they will be able to, to pop up on your screen, and you can download all of these for free from our site. Well, not the fishing project books, sorry, I'll talk about those last. But uh, The Ohio Field Guide to Aquatic Invasive Species, uh, you'll soon hear from, um, from Eugene Bragg, who was a co-author on this, and also uh, John Navarro from the Division of Wildlife was as well. And we worked with the Ohio Aquatic Invasive Species Committee to come up with a list, and pretty proud of that, uh, that book, so please pick it up or download it if you have the chance. Um, we also have some fact sheets. Uh, Be a responsible grass carp owner came out last year. So if you are a pond owner, grass carp, triploid grass carp are uh, a useful tool, um, but we still shouldn't be letting them get out into our natural waterways. So that's good fact sheet related to that. There's a general one on aquatic invasive species in the Great Lakes. And then a new article just came out, again, really focused on uh, getting people involved in angling, uh, but there's also blurbs in there about not dumping your bait and helping to stop aquatic invasive species. And then the last thing I'll put down there, uh, similarly, uh, our 4-H fishing project books. Uh, again, they are designed to get kids fishing, uh, but they're actually available for sale on Ohio State's 4-H website. 
I believe they're somewhere around $7 each. So um, anybody can go on that website and purchase them. There's a lot of great information in there and a lot of the, the activities or the other resources are focused on invasive species and how anglers can, can help prevent the spread of those. So um, I'm sure there's some I'm leaving out, uh, Sarah or anybody else on this call, if you would like to like to fill in, that's great. But I thought those were the ones that we could highlight. And uh, please get in touch with me if you have any questions on, on any of those. Thanks, Tori, that was perfect. That's great. My name is Eugene Bregg. I am Program Director for Aquatic Ecosystems Extension with The Ohio State University. So I'm charged with doing outreach about wet things. And I'm going to quickly talk about a committee that we have in Ohio to help inform the management uh, against aquatic invasive species, the Ohio Aquatic Invasive Species Committee. I'll start by just reading to you our mission statement because it's a statement of what we do. We provide a forum for Ohio's diverse stakeholders, its resource management agencies and related industries and organizations to advise the state about the prevention and control of aquatic invasive species and for the state to inform those stakeholders about developing issues and policy. So in essence, it's kind of a uh, communication forum. It's a two-way communication forum, both for those who are interested in invasive species to inform the state and help formulate policy, and for the state to tell those stakeholders what's going on, what, what news there is, what new policies are being developed. So we're essentially an informal advisory service to the programs of the Ohio Department of Natural Resources Division of Wildlife, we usually have two meetings every year, but 2020 is anything but a typical year, so it's, we're not usual. We probably won't be meeting at all in person throughout 2020. And this is the most un unbearable URL you may have ever encountered, so I won't read the URL to you, but hopefully you can pause the video long enough to make notes or perhaps even click a link to get to this URL. This is our web page, and all of the presentations that we've had at least recently are posted to that web page if you want to find a tremendous amount of information regarding what we are discussing at those meetings. And our membership is deliberately diverse. I will not read the details of this list because very little would make my monotonous baritone more monotonous than reading a list, but I will at least tell you the general makeup of our, of our group. We are represented by state and federal agencies as well as um, quasi-governmental entities with relevant operations within the state of Ohio. Park districts and zoos, so municipalities have representation, city governments and county governments. Uh, Non-government organizations. And we have a fair number of industry representatives and consultants, things like fish farmers, uh, the shipping industry, the charter fishing industry, um, all have representation on our committee. And we do vet policy. A couple of recent policies that have passed through our group uh, before they were implemented. First, the Division of Wildlife's determination of injurious aquatic invasive species in Ohio. This, in essence, is our mechanism for creating a blacklist regarding cultured organisms. And the Ohio Invasive Plant Rule. Both of these are recent policies that were vetted by our committee. If you're interested in aquatic plants, these are the initial 15 that have some either aquatic or wetland aspect to their life histories that are listed as, as blacklisted and no longer permitted to change hands within the state of Ohio. We also provided input uh, for the updates to the comprehensive state management plan for aquatic invasive species. You can download this document. Uh, it is comprehensive. It touches about uh, on something regarding all aspects of aquatic invasive species in the state of Ohio. And maintaining this plan also makes the state of Ohio eligible for some funding from the Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force from the federal government. The people who are there uh, to run this program, first off, our program is to inform the, the programming, especially of John Navarro, who is the administrator of the Division of Wildlife's Aquatic Invasive Species Programs, and me, who I, co I coordinate and chair the committee. And this is where you can find me if you want additional information. Uh, on the fly, I've also added just a few slides to the very end to talk about some identification and database resources regarding monitoring the spread of aquatic invasive species. So the first one is the U.S. Geological Survey's Non-Indigenous Aquatic Species Database, 
It has a really nice flexible search engine. It has uh, fact sheets attached to every listed species and range maps that are updated with tremendous frequency. Those range maps are also interactive. You can get down to lat and long for many sightings. So check out the NAS database. It's a tremendously valuable tool for both identification of invasive organisms and some sense for where they have been found, especially in recent times. Connected to the USGS database, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration also operates uh, what is called the GLANSYS database. And the GLANSYS draws its data very directly from the US Geological Surveys database, but it is Great Lakes specific. And it has a Great Lakes specific search engine that is very plastic. It's a very um, uh, powerful search engine that you can refine different fields. Uh, so for example, you can search by lake, you can search by watershed of the lake or the lake proper, or you can narrow it by taxonomy. For example, searching only fishes or only diatoms, even if you're that nerdy. Uh, check out Glances, a tremendously useful tool operated by NOAA. Lastly, there is EdMaps. EdMaps is, um, let me back up just a little bit. I'm going to quickly mention that when I think of the NAS database of the Geological Survey and related uh, glances of NOAA, the NAS database seems to me to be mostly managed by agency professionals, people who are managing against aquatic invasive species. In contrast, the EdMaps system seems to be mostly used by academics and citizen scientists. But the EdMaps is um, the early detection and distribution mapping system is very deliberately an effort to track the range of invasive species as they spread. It is not aquatic specific. It has terrestrial things in there as well, but lots of aquatic things. And it's a, again, a very useful database. And that database is often uh, fed reports from the public by diverse smartphone apps, including one called the Great Lakes Early Detection Network that you can download by going to go.osu.edu slash gledin, that's G-L-E-D-N, and that will give you an interface with the EdMaps through which you can report aquatic invasive species sightings. Tori's already mentioned this, but it's a handy little book, so I'll mention it too. Uh, check out the Ohio Field Guide to Aquatic Invasive Species that was edited by Tori, John Navarro, and I. And that's all I have to say. Our next partner that we're going to hear from is Mark Warman from Cleveland Metro Park. Mark, take it away. Thanks, Sarah. Um, my name is Mark Warman. I'm the Aquatic Invasive Species Project Coordinator at Cleveland Metro Parks. And um, this position really came about um, because Cleveland Metro Parks discovered um, an aquatic invasive plant in our park district, Hydrilla. And we knew enough about the plant from other states to know that we did not want it spreading in our region, and especially not to Lake Erie, um, where it could interrupt boating, paddle sports, um, it may restrict fishing in some places. Uh, and we wrote a grant and were funded by the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative to do early detection and rapid response to hydrilla in Ohio's Lake Erie Basin. And that project has grown um, since 2018. Uh, it is now funded by Ohio Department of Natural Resources and US Fish and Wildlife Services, again, through Great Lakes Restoration. And uh, we're, we're concerned with more than just hydrilla. So aquatic invasive plants, early detection and rapid response, again, in anything that drains into Lake Erie in Ohio. So I'm pretty plant centric. And maybe half of my time or so is spent on early detection. Uh, we work with public and private landowners. Uh, if you've got a permanent water body that drains into Lake Erie eventually, um, I'd like to know what plants are growing there. Uh, the earlier we're able to map the distribution and abundance of some of these nuisance weedy plants, uh, the better we will be able to stop them from spreading and maybe spare some headaches for our region in the long run. Uh, a big part of that work is prevention. So Cleveland Metro Parks is very happy to support the Great Lakes Landing Blitz because uh, if we can stop people from maybe purchasing or transporting these plants around, uh, it, it will really reduce management costs in the long term. And uh, we serve kind of as a coordinating agency for the Great Lakes, Ohio's Great Lakes region. Um, 
we connect other partners to resources, research, management practices. If you have a plant like European Frogbit, which is the background of this slide. So I'll move on to some other aquatic invasive plants of concern. This is not an exhaustive list. I think there were 67 species of plants and algae uh, that were identified as invasive or potentially invasive in the Great Lakes region. So this is just a small sampling, but these are some of the worst. So if these are familiar to you or you've identified these in your own water body in Ohio, um, in the Lake Erie Basin, um, please let us know, or just in Ohio in general. Um, you're free to contact me anytime. Uh, we do a lot of unknown aquatic plant identification. So uh, I like getting pictures of unknown plants, um, especially if they're native. And there are other agencies that will collect and display this information too. So I, I listed a few of those. The Great Lakes Early Detection Network is a good smartphone app. Um, it's connected to other databases in the Great Lakes region. We've had a lot of success in Cleveland Metro Parks at using iNaturalist, which you can put on your phone or uh, access it from the computer. And then a, a good authoritative resource, resource for um, aquatic invasive plants is the U.S. Geological Survey's Non-Indigenous Aquatic Species Database, and that's best accessed from a computer. So um, just in summary, if you are a public or private landowner in Ohio's Lake Erie Basin and you've got permanent water um, and you haven't checked for invasive plants, um, Cleveland Metro Parks can help with that. And if you or if we find invasive aquatic plants, um, we can help with management options, uh, aligning funding, help with staff resources, and just help identifying what's growing in your water body. So um, that's, that's the Great Lakes Aquatic Invasive Plant Project in a nutshell. And I'll pass it off to Cindy. My name's Cindy Koss, and I am the, I work with uh, ODNR, Ohio Department of Natural Resources, Parks and Watercraft. And I am the uh, uh, voting education coordinator for the state of Ohio. And some of the ways that we have been working with uh, the Clean Marinas Clean Boating Program is we are trying to include the message about invasive species and how to be a clean uh, boater and even a clean marina in our Ohio Operator's Guide, the Boating, uh, boating Operator's Guide. So in order to do that, that book goes out to just about every boater and every fisherman, fisherwoman in the state of Ohio. So with that book, getting the message out about invasive species and how to prevent them from being spread um, is a very important step that we can help, you know, partner with um, the Clean Marinas Clean Boating Program. Another way that we are trying to uh, assist with the, the issue of invasive species and clean boaters, clean marinas, is through our uh, boating education courses. Um, we're hoping to include all kinds of good, important information to each participant at the boating education course and the, what we call them OBEX, Ohio Boating Education Course. At the OBEX, um, the, the participants will be able to um, learn more about invasive species, learn more about being a clean boater, in hopes to help reduce the spread of these aquatic nuisances. Um, one more thing that ODNR, Parks and Watercraft, is assisting with is our through our naturalists. Our naturalists are teaching different programs and activities. Anytime that they go out and take a group out canoeing or kayaking or even stand up paddle boarding, they talk about invasive, you know, species of aquatic nuisance. So they are able to um, teach people how to identify them and why we shouldn't allow them in our waterways. And, and it's not just to the waterways. They are also teaching in, uh, invasive species, uh, the terrestrial species. So they, get, they will host removal events where they get groups together to help remove them from the water or remove them from the land. And um, they, they do different activities and programs. One of my favorites called Alien Invaders. Inva I'm sorry, Alien Invaders. 
where they are teaching about what is a good plant and what is a bad plant. Um, this is all very, very important to get the education component out there because once you teach someone something, then they have the interest in knowing more. And that is one of the goals with ODNR, Parks and Watercraft, is to educate and to teach and to assist with the removal of these aquatic nuisances. Thanks so much. Thank you, Cindy. Alrighty. Next up um, from one of our partner presentations is Jennifer Buhite with the um, ODNR Old Woman Creek National Estuarine Research Reserve, who's gonna talk about some of the efforts that they're doing there for aquatic invasive species in Ohio. Thanks, Jen. Hi, yeah. So um, we have a coastal wetland in our national estuary um, that is open to Lake Erie. Some of the time we have a barrier beach. Sometimes the creek runs through that barrier beach and we can get um, flow in from Lake Erie, uh, which is great for, for water and our fish, but also opens us up to some invasive species. Uh, some of the ones that we've really worked on in the past are um, Phragmites. Uh, rising water levels have helped us combat that one, um, as well as some, um, some herbicide application. Um, but in 2017, uh, we found European frog bit for the first time in Old Woman Creek. Um, we, were, we weren't super familiar with it. Uh, our watershed coordinator from our soil and water uh, district uh, helped us identify it and um, came up with an action plan for combating it. Um, it is tricky to deal with uh, chemically, so with herbicide application. So we have found that mechanical removal is the best way to do it. So that's basically um, humans in the estuary, uh, in the wetlands, pulling it out. Um, so I have some pictures here to kind of get an idea of what it is. So that it is lit, it's about in between a quarter and a half dollar size a uh, little floating uh, aquatic plant that is uh, a couple rosettes right there. So they come in in these, these little groupings. Um, eventually, if left unbothered, it forms dense mats across the surface of the water that can be up to a meter thick. Uh, in fact, in 2017, by um, September, we did a removal and we could roll it like a carpet um, and, and drag it out. Um, so it does get quite um, thick and dense and mess, and thus it blocks um, resources for the other um, either plants or animals that live there. So it blocks sunlight from going through, it can block oxygen exchange, and because it doesn't belong in uh, Ohio, our Ohio animals don't eat it. So um, if we don't remove it, it basically goes unbothered. So for the past couple of years, we've been training volunteers to uh, one, identify it, and then remove it for us. We usually have a couple group pulls, so uh, we'll meet up, we'll go out in our canoes or our kayaks together and spend a morning removing it. Um, but we also have volunteers that will go out um, on their own if they have their own boat or borrow a boat from us um, various times throughout the week and then collect it. Um, so there it is, there's up close and we have, um, we provide buckets. We also provide these little expandable rakes um, so that it extends your reach from the boat. Uh, and volunteers have access to all of that equipment. We give them a little, one of those little clickers so that they can count, we count the number of rosettes. Um, and then they're composted in a pile away from the water's edge so that, you know, nothing can get back into the water. Um, and uh, here's one of our very dutiful volunteers showing all of her gear. She's got a clicker around her neck, um, a couple buckets, and a boat full of frog bit. And this was from um, the beginning of, of July. Uh, over the past couple of years, we've noticed less and less of those big mats um, developing by late fall. Uh, so we feel that this mechanical removal through our volunteer work has worked pretty effectively for us. Uh, in other wetlands um, along coastal Lake Erie, uh, in, in McGee Marsh and Howard's Marsh, um, they haven't controlled for it, and it's gotten um, 
it's they have some areas where they have total coverage of frogbit. So it is important to, to remove it um, to keep kind of our natural areas um, as natural and native as possible. This year, um, we've removed 10,000 rosettes of frogbit. Um, and, you know, this is kind of a slow year for us because obviously we couldn't have the big numbers and group holes that we normally have. We had to keep it 10 people or under. Um, and then we haven't had as many volunteers, um, you know, willing to go out on their own, understandably, um, due, to, due to the virus conditions. Um, but we have had people put in over 100 hours, I think we're up to 110 hours of volunteering. And that's basically just from the end of May through just the first weekend in July. Um, all those hours were, were put in and all those rosettes were collected. Um, so it's been a pretty successful program. We always do a, a bit of a training for the volunteers in the beginning. Um, and then um, we, we do some group pulls and then we have them go out on their own. Um, this year we also uh, have a survey tool. It's called Survey123 through ArcGIS. And um, you can pull it up on your smartphone and it'll ask you what time of day, how long you were out there, how many results you collected, and then you can pinpoint your location in the estuary so we can kind of map out the estuary, um, break it into zones, and then um, see where which zones are heaviest with the frog bit, and then we can send people to those areas the next time. So that's been our summer of frog bit removal. And last but not least, we have Kurt Wagner um, with the ODNR Division of Wildlife, and so he's going to summarize some of the efforts that they're doing, um, I believe, out in the field um, for, for invasive species across Ohio. So, Kurt, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Yeah. yeah, so my name is Kurt Wagner. I'm with the ODNR Division of Wildlife, Fish Management Supervisor uh, for Northeast Ohio District 3. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit today about the steps that we take internally when we're doing our fish survey work and other on-the-water work um, to stop the spread of aquatic invasive species. Um, you know, unlike anglers or recreational boaters who probably most often, you know, routinely visit one or two lakes regularly, um, we could be hopping across two, three, four, five lakes in one week with the same boat and the same equipment. And so it's uh, very important to us to do whatever steps we can to not move um, aquatic invasive species from, from one reservoir or lake to another. Um, so specifically, we have drawn up uh, some documents to address that, to provide some protocol. Let me try to share my screen. Yeah, there we go. Um, statewide, we operate from for the inland fisheries management. So that's their inland lakes and reservoirs outside of Lake Erie. We operate under what we call the inland management uh, system, IMS. I'll probably uh, slip into acronym language and call it the IMS here. Um, and this IMS guides when we sample for what species with what gear um, across the whole state. So all five inland uh, management districts within the Division of Wildlife all follow this protocol year after year for our fish sampling. And in this document, I mean, this document outlines what gear we use and has, you know, our entire process. But we do have uh, down here towards the top, page 15, it was very important for us to specify um, how we're going to manage our procedures uh, for aquatic nuisance species and even disease, things like uh, BHS virus and other fish viruses. Uh, essentially, I mean, I'm not going to read this all to, to the audience, but essentially what we do is we, we disinfect all of our equipment. So that's boats and our sampling gear. Um, and, and for our boats, essentially we are visually uh, cleaning off any debris. So aquatic vegetation, um, you know, mud, anything on the outside of the boat and trailer when we pull it up after coming off the ramp. We do this right at the ramp after our survey. It could be 2 a.m. and we're getting off from a night survey, but we're still going to do this. Um, so we, we pick everything off the boat and trailer. Um, we then use a disinfectant, and I'll scroll down here. Uh, we either use just chlorine bleach solution or Vicron. Um, either one is fine. Uh, we generally use the bleach in our district. We bring our own water with us, so we're not going to use lake water. We're going to use fresh tap water from, from our office. Um, and we have it pre-mixed, uh, we use the pump sprayers and we'll have one person spraying the outside of the, the boat hall in the trailer, another person spraying the inside uh, surfaces that have gotten wet, which oftentimes our whole boat, but certainly the floor, the bilge area, our live well where we uh, keep fish when we're working up fish for survey work. Um, we even spray down our, our own um, 
PPE equipment, our, our boots and our um, rain gear. And so we'll, we'll spray all that down and dry it off when we get back to the office and put everything away for the night. Um, that way things are hard disinfected for the next day. Um, inside the boat, we also pick out any fragments of debris or mussels that we may see or little fish that may have you know, been regurgitated by big fish when we're working up fish, anything to avoid the spread. Um, so it's really, a, it's a visual inspection, it's picking stuff off physically and then it's the disinfection and letting it dry out. Um, our gear, so we'll lay nets out and we'll dry them in the sun, we'll spray them with bleach, um, you know, any of the tools, measuring boards, other types of equipment we're using, we'll, we'll bleach off. Anything that might touch the water the next day or other fish the next day. So that's pretty much our, our process and our protocol. Um, you know, we, we you don't really know if it's making a difference and I can, I, as an angler myself, I understand you get off the lake, you're tired, you wanna get home, you have other things to do. Um, same with work, you know, you get off the lake, you wanna just get home, but uh, you know, although you can't really see the direct results in the moment, um, it certainly isn't hurting and it probably is helping by doing these measures. So I would certainly encourage folks to, uh, you know, consider doing that to their own boats, um, even on a recreational standpoint. So that's what we do, sir. Next, we have Paul Patalski with the Lake Erie Charter Boat Association. So, Paul, I'll let you speak. Okay. Uh, we as charter boat uh, members are out there on a daily basis, and we are in kind of the perfect situation to talk about and educate people on invasive species. As we go out, you know, we might catch a a goby when we're bass fishing or a, a white perch when we're walleye fishing, uh, reel up lines that are coated with uh, bethotrophy or spidey water fleas. And I think uh, most people take that opportunity to talk about how our watershed or our system is changing and uh, not always for the better, whether it be the gobies and the zebra mussels and how that has changed or uh, the spidey water flea with how it's changing the diets of the yellow perch and making them more difficult to catch, uh, the white perch, the uh, Asian carp that are coming in. I think it's probably one of the best learning opportunities and teaching opportunities for people because it's actually hands-on and they find out that once one of these invasive species enters our water, whether it be animal, vegetable, or mineral, it doesn't leave. I mean, uh, all of these that have come into our ecosystem, if they find it good enough to live, they find it good enough to reproduce and uh, proliferate. And even, you know, we do have uh, people that uh, run water tours that take people on different uh, aquatic adventures, just sightseeing. And we always point out the different uh, invasive species that are along the shoreline and how it changes things and what they don't offer that our native plants do. And I think uh, it, it's one of the best outreaches that you could have because we do have a captive audience for six, eight hours. And you know, you, you actually listen to the captain because you don't have much else to do. <laughs> but that, that's all I have to say. Paul, thanks. That's great. And we appreciate that because, you know, you guys, a lot of us on this um, webinar, you know, this is our part of our jobs, right? And so we are, our job is to educate and to help um, folks prevent the spread of invasive species. But, you know, you and your organization, um, you know, your main job is, is taking people, you know, recreational fishing. And um, you're doing this um, like you said, because um, you, you care about the fishery, you want to be around and you're doing it voluntarily. So thank you. And you guys are a good example of, of one such organization or even just a, a group of individuals that can make a difference um, just by helping to educate others. So awesome. Well, with that, um, I'm going to close out for now. 
and um, stop our recording. What I want to do is step back here for just one second and remind folks, if you do want to get involved, um, I will share the resources from all of our partners on the efforts that they have done and continue to do. Um, but again, this annual landing blitz is just um, really a reminder and a focused um, time period during the year where we truly try and promote um, preventing the spread of invasive species and things that people can do to help. And so we hope you consider joining us next year and in the future. Um, we hope some of the information we've shared with you today is helpful um, and that it makes you maybe stop and think a little bit more before leaving a body of water about ways that you can help. Um, so thank you for joining us today. Uh, feel free to reach out. I think I have my contact information at the end here. Um, so if you need any more information or have any questions about um, either this program, uh, the landing blitz, or any of the other um, things that our organizations and partners in Ohio are doing to prevent the spread of invasive species and educate on aquatic invasive species, uh, feel free to reach out anytime.